welcome everybody to our National iThrive programme webinar. So today's focus is on the Thrive Framework for System Change and Equality, Diversity and Inclusion. Um, so we've got a very exciting and packed agenda for our webinar this morning and delighted to have everybody join. And I think there will be some people joining as we go through, but um, perhaps it's most helpful just to run through some of the housekeeping while people are joining us this morning. So um, I'm the uh, clinical and program director for the National I Thrive program team. And um, I'm also one of the co-authors. My name is Rachel James. Um, many of you, I'm sure, will be familiar with you with um, with the work of the iThrive program team. And to those who aren't, you're, it's great to have you here today because we know we've got some new members, so you're very welcome. Um, what I just wanted to go through is that um, we're going to be recording this webinar, and probably as you joined, actually, you were informed of that because you have to accept, of course, to be able. Um, to be uh, let into the webinar. And the reason for that is um, that we load all of our webinars onto our website so that those who are not able to join for many reasons um, can view the webinar at a future point in time. So in order to do that, of course, we have to try and manage things. So if you could keep your camera turned off and mute yourself unless you are asking a question and then in which if you are asking a question, do please do feel free to, um, to undo both the mute and uh, the camera. But then if you do need to communicate any technical issues, please use the chat function, which will be monitored by one of the team and we can attend to that as soon as possible. And if you have any questions or reflections on the content of the presentations, please also use the chat function to submit that. And it can really, it's really helpful for the Q&A um, to indicate who you would like to address any comments or questions to. And if you don't want your name to be included, bear in mind it's being recorded, um, you might want to choose to do that. But obviously, um, please, if you are happy to, do keep your, your name. Um, and But you have the option to select anonymously if you want to do that. We are going to be sending the slides out to all those who attend the webinar. So um, you know, please be assured of that. And you'd be welcome to share both the slides and the link of the recording to any colleagues who might not have been able to join today. There will also be um, opportunities for you to share any comments or reflections after the webinar and you can share them at our usual email address which is ithriveinfo at tavier-port.nhs.uk. So now on to today's agenda. Um, no actually thank you, I missed that one. Um, what we wanted to really <laughs> look at the agenda. So um, Today, we, I'm going to do some brief um, overview in the next couple of minutes, and then I'm going to hand over to colleagues, um, Tom Rains from NHS ENI and Deborah McLean Thorne and Daphna Bichachi from the National Children's Bureau, who are going to give us an overview of their work in addressing inequalities in accessing mental health and wellbeing help and support through the lens of personalised care and personal health budgets, which um, is going to be a really interesting and invigorating discussion I'm sure. Then we have our colleague Al Mully from the Dartmouth Institute who's going to be presenting um, some slides around Thrive as the learning front end of an integrated care system addressing inequalities in mental health access and outcomes. So um, welcome to Al and also we have Georgie Fozard who's a DARSI fellow who's going to share some reflections on a journey from theory to action regarding co-production. So we will then um, close, uh, have an opportunity for feedback using a Mentimeter, but also obviously during the discussions there'll be, um, we're inviting you to share any comments, reflections or questions that we will try and um, ask the speakers to attend to with a view to closing for midday. So quite, quite a busy agenda. Um, so important to, to make use of time and move on. And I want to just to start with, um, the commitment from the iThrive programme team to equality, diversity and inclusion. And as you're aware, we do work with sites across the country um, in implementing the Thrive Framework for System Change. And we actively promote equality, diversity and inclusion to all our prospective sites to ensure collaboration across the localities, to reduce inequalities and actively promote equitable access for all in relation to mental health and wellbeing. 
we absolutely celebrate and value difference and the benefits that diverse individuals and communities can contribute to the delivery of mental health and wellbeing provision. And our aspiration is that all mental health and wellbeing provision is accessible, welcoming and inclusive for all. And we wanted to really reiterate that commitment at the start of this really important webinar, um, where of course the pandemic has really shone such a, um, a brighter light really on um, the importance of health inequalities and the reality that we all need to take further steps to develop population health management approaches that address inequalities in access, experience and outcomes. And that we, we absolutely need to work with local partners across health, social care and beyond. And that, you know, uh, uh, there's an awful lot of work going on at a governmental level um, and, you know, our colleagues from NHS E&I um, are very much focused on a number of priority areas to really tackle those inequalities and in systems um, going forward. But of course, we can all take ownership of embedding equality, diversity and inclusion in our work. And what's really important, we're not always going to get it right all of the time, but it's really important to be open, transparent, open to feedback and do something about that feedback. And also importantly, sharing the impact of any feedback so that people know that, that people are listening and doing something about um, issues that are being raised. In terms of the Thrive Framework key principles, we just wanted to revisit them to set, set that context around the Thrive Framework and equality, diversity and inclusion. Now, as everyone on this call, I'm sure is aware that um, a key principle of the Thrive Framework is about having a common language and the conceptual framework and its five needs based groupings really support a shared language and understanding across the system that is easily available, accessible and communicated to all children, young people and their parents and carers in different localities across the country have taken this a step further to develop their own language in collaboration with their local populations. The Thrive Framework is needs led with um, the approach being absolutely based on meeting need, not on diagnosis or severity. And it's explicit about the definition of need at any one point and particularly and crucially what the plan is in relation to mental health and wellbeing, support, help and support and everyone's role within that plan. And fundamental to that being successful is a common understanding of the needs-based groupings across the local system, taking into, the, into account the needs of different communities and populations and of course, that, you know that is uh, there are significant variations in the communities and populations across the country and um, of course shared decision making is, a, is another key principle with the voice of children young people and their families being central and particularly crucial in this area that uh, is the importance of shared decision making for those who might have previously experienced being disempowered in decision making processes about their care Another key principle is, of course, around proactive prevention and promotion and the importance of enabling the whole community to support mental health and well-being. So really importantly, uh, proactively working with the most vulnerable groups. We know um, that there are different um, vulnerabilities across the population and we really need to focus on how to help children, young people and their communities build on their own strengths. And that does include safety planning within a community context, which can be, of course, highly anxiety provoking and needs specialist support to enable that prevention and promotion within different communities and populations. So just uh, the, the final key principles are around partnership working. So ensuring that there's effect, so effective cross-sector working with service user participation and genuine shared user participation at the heart of the work. Um, to ensure that there's that shared responsibility, accountability and mutual respect based on those five needs based groupings. In terms of outcomes that there's clarity and transparency from the outset about children and young people's goals with measurement of progress, movement and action plans um, and where there's explicit discussion if goals aren't achieved. And within that, it's really important to consider the full range of options. We're going to hear, as I say, from NHS e &I in relation to the personalisation agenda and some work that the NCB have done um, looking at, at uh, children, young people's perspectives from different uh, communities in relation to that today. Of course, we need to ensure that mental health and wellbeing is everyone's business and support communities to have access to support that does consider their beliefs, their existing support systems and their individual and cultural needs. 
and also ensuring that, that uh, any advice, help and risk support is available in a timely way for children, young people or their families, wherever they are in their communities. So we just wanted to remind everybody of those key principles of the Thrive Framework, but we, before now we move on to hearing from our colleagues from different um, se uh, settings in relation to the work that they've been doing. So I'll now hand over to our colleagues, uh, Tom, Deborah and Daphna, uh, who will um, do a much better job of introducing uh, their presentation today. So thanks very much and over to you, Tom, Deborah and Daphna. Uh, thank you, Rachel. Um, it's really nice to be here and thank you for the invite. Um, I'm, my name is Tom Raines. I'm the policy lead in the personal health budget team in um, NHS England. We sit within the personalised care group and um, I'm just going to do a brief overview of where this project come, come from before I hand over to um, Deborah and Defna. So if we just go on to the next slide, please. So just a little bit of background from myself I and mean, the project built on work that's been um, has been delivered within the PHP delivery team in recent years, particularly work led by my colleague, colleague Janet Blair in relation to looked after children with mental health support needs and also the CAMS development project. So there's been a number of work going around, a number of work streams running around children and young people and mental health. And I think what we were really interested in um, was taking this work further into a bit more detail. These projects identified um, the benefits that can be brought about through personalised care interventions, particularly personal health budgets, social prescribing and so forth. And we wanted to look into this in a bit more detail, which led to the development of this project, which you're going to hear about today. So we particular focus, yes, on PHB, social prescribing, and we're particularly interested in those children and young people experiencing poor mental health and social deprivation. So it became quite niche, it's quite a specific group that we're talking about focusing on. And some of these issues were also again brought up by, again, as Rachel's mentioned, by the pandemic as well. We were also influenced, particularly with those um, issues that we were seeing around health inequalities during the pandemic, and also NHS England and Improvement's corporate approach to the issue of health inequalities as well. Health inequalities are referenced explicitly in the long term plan. There was um, a letter sent out to systems last summer as we moved from into a phase three of the pandemic before we moved back up again. But again, that identified a number of key actions that the health system needed to address with regard to health inequalities. And this has been updated further since in the operational planning guidance for 21 and 22. So we're in that process of working with systems to develop that at the moment. So that's just a brief bit of background from me. Again, the project was funded by our own health inequalities working group in the personalised care group. And there is further information also on the Future NHS collaboration platform. There's a link at the bottom of your screen there. So that links again into work streams around personal health budgets, social prescribing, health inequalities, as well as broader personalised care. So again, if you are interested, please do have a look at the platform. I'm going to leave it there from me and I'm going to hand over to Deborah to continue. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Tom. Uh, so yeah, as Tom said, um, National Children's Bureau was commissioned to basically develop a body of evidence regarding what works to enhance personalised care offer uh, within CAMS or wider children's uh, services that support mental health, um, whilst also sort of demonstrating whether there's a reduction in health inequalities. So, as you said, this piece of work was very much focused on personal health budgets and social prescribing. So, for those of you who may not know um, National Children's Bureau, um, we're um, a national organisation that's been around for since about the 1960s. And we're about bringing people and organisations together um, to support changes that can improve, um, but make a better childhood across the UK. So we work with policy research and we support practitioners and we're very much about building partnerships. So for this piece of work, um, the priorities for NHS England was very much about 
working with these selected local areas with high social uh, levels of social deprivation, um, a mix of urban and rural um, with the sort of offers covering personal health budgets and social prescribing and, and other elements of personalised care and sort of different levels of maturity uh, in terms of their offer. So it was about focusing on that, that best practice, looking at kind of what were the facilitators and also the challenges uh, in making that work. So just moving on to, to the next slide, you can see kind of what our um, overview is here really of the time frame for that. Um, so the main elements of the project. So the project areas, the sites that we were working with were already in place in terms of uh, on board with the project through uh, Janet and Tom's team. And we were able to start our dialogue with them with the key leads there um, at the end of last year, really. And at the end of last year and beginning of this year, we were interviewing those site leads um, just to kind of get their understanding of the context and particularly around their perception really of those successes and challenges. Um, and then from about February onwards, we've been conducting um, focus groups and individual interviews with young people and parents and carers within those local areas, those taking part in, in the pilots. And we've also been receiving some written feedback as well from the participants. And the aim is really to be writing this up for, for June. So that's our kind of timeline for that. So just moving on to look a little bit more about who those sites were. So we, as I said, we had a kind of mix of areas um, across the country, including some more rural areas, particularly in, in Nottinghamshire. Um, uh, but in this um, presentation today, we'll be mainly focusing on the Bristol scheme, you're in control, the Thurrock scheme, uh, positive pathways just there on the edge of London, on the edge of East London, and we'll talk a little bit about the Nottinghamshire scheme, you know your mind. Um, so we've got some further interviews to come in whole, um, particularly around some, their social prescribing service, and we'll be looking at that uh, later. So just in terms of an understanding of uh, social deprivation, we kind of conducted a, an initial literature review and we considered the sort of different domains of social deprivation that were likely to cut across our cohort in those local areas we were working with. Um, and particularly obviously looking at one um, around income and poverty and four, I suppose, um, around health and the inequalities there. And that was obviously very much reflected particularly around income in the discussions we had uh, with the young people and families. Um, and I'll come back to that in our, in our findings. And so just um, thinking a bit more um, about those inequalities, um, highlighted in blue here, I guess, are where we um, envisaged and in the end there were a lot of our participants and particularly around um, looked after children and care leavers, but also in those whose parents had suffered mental illness and people with um, ASD and other learning disabilities. So just to kind of look at Thurrock, um, that area on the, on the edge of East London there, um, the, it started really in Thurrock and Brentwood Mind um, in 2017. Um, they had a service design in mind approach to identifying young people's mental health service needs and co-design services for, for people there in Thurrock. And they were focused really on those young people, many of whom might have mental health needs, but hadn't received any formal mental health support. And they were hearing that a lot of young people were reporting that um, they weren't of resources available. And that came up a lot um, throughout um, our study, weren't available of the resources available locally, and they really wanted reliable information and signposting. And there was a real recognition, I think, underneath this, that um, the emotional well-being and mental health service, or EUMS, their clinicians had a challenge, and which was giving them a hesitancy um, about discharging children and young people from their service, as they felt there was a kind of significant drop in the support services available locally at those moments of transition. So inevitably, what that meant was those clinicians were holding on to young people, and then the knock-on effect of that 
would be an impact on waiting times. So just to kind of move on and look at what the, the process was um, that they went into, uh, which really got going in November 2018. So it starts off their, their positive pathways process with um, clinicians identifying if a young person needs community support during their clinical work. And then they can suggest perhaps the positive pathways scheme to the young person and then link them into the project. The clinician then arranges a call uh, with the youth facilitator there to see what support is available. And then the clinician and the youth facilitator work together to support the young person. So there is a, a referral form and a pro forma that's filled in um, for mine by the clinician before a face-to-face -face meeting is arranged for the young person to meet the facilitator with the clinician in attendance. So the, so the Ames worker has had previous contact with the young person, meets that youth facilitator and the young person to discuss what they want to achieve. And that's usually in a place co-located co in the UMS office and the clinician then arranges the meeting at the end of the therapy session. That helps then for that transition to feel smooth. Um, but obviously where you might expect, um, where there hasn't been that much engagement with UMS or the referral comes after that contact has ended with UMS, then the engagement with positive pathways can be lower. That's obviously more difficult. So there is a kind of personalised care and support, support plan session with the Mind Youth Facilitator worker and the young person and their family. So the youth facilitator, they explore what's available in the community um, that meets the, the, the needs of the young person and their interests. And then they'll, they'll actually introduce them to other organisations in the area in Thurrock. So that's included things, for example, like peer mentoring or a music school. And where there may not be those, those services immediately available, um, a personal health budget has all offered, been offered, um, but there's been sort of relatively uh, few of these. And then just to note there, you can see a little note at the bottom of the screen there, that those young people who were kind of going through that positive pathways process and have been involved really in that sort of service design have also formed a group called Be Unique and they form uh, Meet Fortnightly to Socialise. Um, and that's one of the groups we met with and they really found that absolute important, crucial piece of support for them, and particularly over the last year. So just to move on to um, look at that cohort then. Um, so the focus of cohort, very much about transition from that UMS provision. The age range um, has now been expanded to pick up those around 14, being discharged from the early intervention team. Um, so that we can, and then it's being looked at again to look at um, uh, reaching those at an earlier stage. Um, in terms of looking at um, that cohort in terms of deprivation, um, I think their sort of basic determinant of that really is around postcode. That doesn't always obviously produce a full picture. Um, and it can be challenging, for example, for youth facilitators to have um, difficult conversation, for example, about income or deprivation because that obviously is a sensitive topic and requires a deeper rapport with families. It does obviously sometimes come up in the course of conversations, for example, where a young person can't um, afford photo ID to apply for DBS check or those who miss appointments because they, they can't afford travel. Um, so just to move on. Um, so just to say, um, in terms of our work in Thurrock, um, talking to both the site lead and um, the young people in the focus groups. We held two focus groups there in Thurrock, uh, one with young people um, who are part of the Positive Pathways Scheme and the sort of Be Unique group that I just mentioned, and one uh, with parents and carers of the young people who've been through the project. So we're starting to write up our data from this area. So this is not by any means um, a conclusive set of statements yet. But here's just a kind of summary really of, of, of what's starting to come through from what participants have told us um, about the main strengths as they see them from the local model. So responding quickly obviously is really vital. It sort of builds momentum and helps young people feel listened to and valued. Um, and in, in lockdown, obviously that was really critical, uh, particularly where um, young people wanted to meet physically face-to-face -face in some ways at certain points during that. 
uh, and the team were able to kind of respond very quickly, conduct risk assessment, set up the logistics, set up transport, and that enabled different ways in which people could creatively meet, meet up. Um, during the handover process as well, that was seen, that was valued um, all around. It was obviously highlighted by the practitioners, but also by the young people. Um, so the sort of visibility and the, and the co-location of the youth facilitator and the UNS team, which was really vital to kind of build those strong relationships. And the, and the value of the actual relationships themselves came up as a theme throughout all the areas. Um, sort of the shared vision, um, I think that's obviously really vital. And, you know, just in that example about the kind of intermediary work that they were able to do or the intervening work they were able to do during the sort of sudden lockdown periods, um, they were able to kind of have lots of people within the, the local authority on board who were able to help and support them to get those different alternative creative ways of meeting set up. Um, and obviously kind of that flexibility within the commissioning team. Um, so they weren't limited to a really prescriptive list, for example, of what the, the budget might offer. Um, and they accepted a sort of co-designed wellbeing plan template that allowed the commissioners to consider things on an individual basis. And just in terms of, you know, inequalities um, and particularly sort of low income, that quick access to funding for those who need it was obviously a, a really vital and critical part of it. So just moving on to kind of Bristol, um, that, that, that particular project, which eventually became known as You're in Control, um, that uh, was very much shaped by concern about young people who'd experienced trauma and were eligible for mental health services, but poten potentially not engaging with them. Um, so the co cohort was very much shaped by the concern about that. Um, and they actually said they particularly didn't want just say foster carers and others deciding what young people might like. They wanted the young people to choose. Um, and so even if they didn't sort of have high, uh, meet high thresholds, they, were, they sort of waived that so that they could open up access more widely. So you can see there the kind of the main um, eligibility. So those in care and care leavers that aged between 14 to 21. Um, it was very much a partnership between the CCG, the local authority and Bernardo's all working together. Um, the young people very much co-produced um, that project and even named the project You're in Control, I'm in Control at the beginning. And they, they stayed involved throughout and they were even involved in a large, organizing a large celebratory event. Um, very vital that they have staff very specifically trained up for that. Um, and to be able to kind of hold the different conversations, but also to be able to kind of understand what it meant to have that kind of shared vision and that choice and control with the young person. They, in this case, had one full-time and one part-time post. And I think one of the things that um, was noted again was the speed um, in which they could kind of get things happening. And um, the Bernardos, who were sort of very much leading on the mechanics of that, were saying they were, their systems were able to adapt very quickly, purchasing things quickly, um, that perhaps would, would be difficult in various other settings. And they found that's been an important area for their learning as well. Um, and but there were no issues, I suppose, for them as well, because there was flexibility about what young people were able to spend their budget on. So um, just moving on to the next one. Um, so just looking at um, the referral process, there were a fair few um, self-referrals from different local organisations. I think um, to I say it wasn't many through health, um, it wasn't specifically linked to GPs. Um, and if people weren't accessing the CAM services, um, they weren't necessarily getting through to the pilot service, but the referral was through kind of social care through the, through the um, PA. Um, also um, the uh, unaccompanied asylum seekers organization, such as off the record with work with care leavers, um, important to say, as I said before, the, the, the PAs were trained in those different um, conversations. Um, key to it is that the Bernardos do the main kind of assessing and administering of the budgets, and they actually hand over, uh, make sure that the budget gets hand over to the young person. And that PA works with the young person to fill in the form, um, and they send it to Bernardos who process the request. 
But the, a really key and vital thing in this is that they check that the young person has been satisfactorily involved in the, in the content of the form. And then they help them actually access the budget itself. And I think one of the things that was highlighted as um, a quite an important reflection by the staff specifically, I think, was where it's running alongside other services. So they had a big uh, loneliness and isolation campaign. And again, they were able to kind of make sure there was feed in between um, the two projects. I think at one point they had a kind of panel for um, assessing the forms. Um, but I think, you know, again, during the period of last year, that was became a little bit more of a flexible process and, it, and again, speeded it up. Um, just to move on to the next one. So again, we conducted um, a focus group here of young people who were um, part of that project, uh, very much meeting under um, an umbrella sort of on a regular basis of Care Leavers Unite, so very much staying in, in touch with each other under that and who had um, all been through and had a personal health budget. Um, I think one of the things that um, came up as strengths, I suppose, as a result of, of those, of that particular focus group with young people um, was um, that it was very well suited, I suppose, to those who potentially experience kind of inequalities um, or deprivation. Many of those, I think, have probably been, uh, had that feeling of being exploited or, or blamed for their situation. And this is a kind of a process which actually gives them more control and helps build trust and actually gives them a kind of rung up the ladder. And that was something that was mentioned in the groups around starting something, being able to have a taster of something and really kind of move on and to kind of develop that. So a short term offer such as a, a brief gym membership leads to meeting other people or interests in different exercise and sport. And um, those people, obviously, one of the things that came up as a, as, as a strength here or rather an alternative to the frustration that they have is that they're often um, finding it difficult to access other mental health services as they're on um, a waiting list. And uh, rather than just having to kind of repeat as well their conversations and their story over and over again, going round and round mental health services when they've experienced trauma, which is very difficult, um, this now is kind of a new conversation which puts them much more in control and they don't feel quite so processed through the either the care system or the sort of rigid mental health system. So um, again, this being very much led by the children and young people, they were involved in, in co-producing that, coming up with the name, as I said, and very much valued their role in that. And one of the things that was prized a lot really by the young people, and this was repeated across, across the projects, was the enthusiasm really of that team and the sort of relationships, the very sort of strength of the relationships that they built, built with the coordinators in that team. Um, the, in, in the sort of in their offer, they have a kind of enhanced budget and a standard smaller budget. And I think one of the things they were keen to look at was the sort of impact from some of the enhanced budgets. Um, and one of the things that they um, talked about was someone here who was kind of able to have enhanced support when they just moved into a new sort of property, new housing, and were able to get an, an awful lot of additional support, both in terms of advice and particular things within the, the home to help them. So just moving on to Nottingham. Um, so this covers um, both uh, the city and Nottinghamshire, um, and they named their um, You Know Your Mind. And as you can see, there were a, a sort of list of joiner to the pilot. Um, so the county joined first. Um, just, to, just to note here um, that um, their uh, structure is very much um, a social work practice model. So rather than kind of through, through health, which they talked about as being an advantage. Um, there, again, their main cohort was through um, looked after children. Um, they don't require a mental health diagnosis for that. Um, and it's again, the social worker um, or a, a PA for care leaver who advises if the person has un, unmet emotional health needs. Um, and it's very, again, critical part of this element that 
the young person is, is very much considered to identify themselves the support that they need that can improve their mental health. Um, so again, and I think I noticed this in, in the introduction earlier, Rachel, was that um, it's, it's very much aimed at not stigmatizing uh, people and their mental health, but what can help them on their good days. So those conversations are very much about that and the kind of what, what's a good day look like for you. Um, and there have been times when they've been quite flexible when uh, about the funding. So if the funding's run out, let's say um, after 12 months, they've been able to find ways of continuing that if the impact's been significant. Um, but the main uh, principle behind it is the young person is leading and directing it. And you can just see there a little note at the bottom about the uptake um, up to Easter last year when some of the figures uh, that we originally were looking at at the beginning were recorded. So just to kind of um, move on, um, just looking, I suppose, a quick note across the areas really, um, just about some of the challenges that were identified in the kinds of process that they've been using and currently, um, I suppose, top of that for the, for the time being at the moment is around um, digital poverty. And I think in Thurrock particularly, um, people highlighted that shift to digital access meant that the team were no longer working in their UIMS building, which that created some difficulty um, around arranging transition meetings. And for some young people, obviously, um, digital access has been a barrier. Um, just also um, highlight the fact that in Bristol, um, there was concerns about whether or not they're reaching across all ethnic groups. Um, they, although they feel that they really have reached into uh, sort of many communities, they have noticed like a real kind of gap, I suppose, in where they've been reaching African Caribbean young men. So there are some challenges around whether you, how much reach there is across all sort of communities and also kind of some of the problems that have been thrown up about digital access. So just moving on to uh, the next slide. So some of the things that um, NHSC are very keen um, to look at really and look at our findings against these areas, the sort of against those individual elements of the um, personalized care model. So particularly around choice and control, for example. Um, and you can see that sort of young people really kind of report um, uh, a really important element of um, choice and control for them. And it's really vital in that. Um, impact on social issues with social deprivation um, and engagement with mental health services and whether either the PHBs um, or the social prescribing um, is making a difference. And um, throughout sort of the coming slides, just to say that we've included quotes from across those focus groups um, and the interviews um, that we've had, um, but obviously they're not exhaustive. There was just so many comments that were made um, about a number of the themes that uh, have come up here. Um, and also some of the figures that we're quoting, those might be adapted because we're still interviewing. And so we'll still be um, introducing kind of more figures into the, the survey that we've done with people. So just to move on. Um, yeah, so the kind of primary um, areas uh, where we were searching for data is, as we say, initial interviews with a number of the site leads themselves, their context, going through some of their background material, their pilot reports, a lot of the supporting documents they've had uh, prepared, including bidding um, for sustainability. Um, but primary focus was on um, the, the groups we've had with young people. And in those, we were using uh, all sorts of techniques, but obviously they were all virtual, they were on Zoom, um, but we used what we could with, uh, with Miro boards and um, surveys built into those groups to get some, a little bit more quantitative data. Um, and we also did the same with parents, had focus groups with parents. Um, we've had um, individual parent interview and um, individual interview with young people. And as I said, we've had some written feedback as well. So yeah, um, just moving on to um, that the next, uh, next slide. Um, so yeah, choice and control. Um, I've just kind of mapped those against the individual elements of the personalized care 
model really there and try to kind of highlight some of those quotes. I'm not sure how visible they all are for you. Um, but you can just see um, reporting being listened to, um, people report that they feel really valued um, in terms of the choice and control as well as them valuing it themselves. Um, the self-management, making sure that young people have been um, very much involved in the content of the form and that it wasn't driven by the professional. Um, and in Nottingham, one of the things that they were using were lots of other tools as well, such as videos or drawings to help explore what young people would like. Would like. Um, so just making sure that that wasn't just too systematic and rigid in itself. Um, and again, something coming up throughout across all the areas was that they felt that it was being um, led by the young people themselves. And an example of that was in Thurrock, where they set up their own um, group, the Be Unique group. Um, again, just a little bit more going through these quite quickly. Um, you can just see again, um, that mapped against the sort of the personalized care model. So sort of moving away from what's the matters uh, with you to what matters to you. And that sort of mixture of practical support um, as, long, uh, as well as the sort of more focused mental health support was really, really vital. Um, but it has to be said um, that the, having that support worker or the coordinator as in a really strong relationship with them was very, very critical throughout. So although those kind of very practical things um, and the, the things they could get from the budgets were vital and they could see that they were a real starting point. Overall, that role of the support worker was, was highly valued. And just also to highlight there, um, they didn't see, and this was, this was reiterated um, in Bristol and Thurrock, um, this intervention as a form of mental health support, but more of a holistic support um, that kind of fed into all aspects of their lives. And also that kind of had a way of taking away that kind of stigma that people often felt was associated with mental health support. And that again, I, I know it was something that was mentioned earlier. So just to move on to the next one. Yeah, just some really nice um, quotes there from young people. Um, the, the best thing about the support is the different conversations, i.e. asking what happens on a good day rather than asking what would happen to your mental health. And one person saying, it's almost enlightening the questions that they ask you. Instead of asking what are your problems, they ask what the solution for that could be. So very much um, something that young people themselves were picking up on as a value. Um, and I think one of the other things that came out, of course, we did interview parents as well. Um, we also interviewed um, young people who themselves were parents, so very young children in um, Bristol. And that key thing about what this um, can do in terms of recognition of the whole family um, that affects the young person's well-being was pointed out. So something that could be um, about somebody receiving a budget within the family that affects everybody um, and everybody benefits from it. So just moving on quickly to the next one. So we, um, as I said, we conducted a kind of a survey within the groups themselves with just a handful of very basic questions um, and just here's another very uh, quick sort of uh, report back of one of those that came out 84% agreed that they're able to feel they can make good decisions about their own health so a great sort of sense of empowerment in that just yeah moving on to the next one Daphne um, and yeah I mean just key things on that left hand column that I guess it picks up um, about how um, it was reiterated um, that it fitted into their needs. So again, that was a quote um, from one of the young people on the right hand side at the top, able to fit into your needs and wants, meets our individual needs, and our needs are not all the same. Um, and another person um, who said sort of further down, how warm and friendly the support worker is, what they like most. Um, so that was in a sort of question in the group about that. Um, Again, something really critical about how it opened up other, um, other opportunities like college and volunteering. And um, again, that sort of link to other opportunities in education was really um, a, a running theme for many people throughout the groups. 
and how it kind of supported them in being referred into different services, support agencies and groups. Um, so um, we did have a question about what they like least and what some of the challenges were. Um, I just want to highlight one thing at the bottom here about um, the reduced worker support. So the role of that worker, which I, I keep thinking I'm repeating here, um, but people said it makes a big difference when you have a worker linked to the personal budget and how it makes it more holistic. Um, it's, it's more difficult, I suppose, if you don't have that solid relationship with the, the worker who's supporting you to really understand the purpose of, of the budget that you're getting. And, and one person said they were, they were one of the first people to get involved in the project. I think this was in Bristol. And for them, this was a big learning stage of the project. They weren't, they didn't quite recognize um, how, you know, how much was open to them and how widely they could use their budget because they just weren't used to that. So just moving on to the next one. Um, again, just some really lovely quotes here. Um, which I think really particularly relate to inequality and in our context of the report um, around social deprivation. Um, I think the one in the bottom right hand corner is the one that stands out to me. There's a kind of intergenerational aspect to that, but I, I, if it's not clear for everybody on that slide, they've just said we couldn't afford any art supplies at all after the benefits were cut. So being able to get those again was huge. As my daughter said, it was the only thing keeping her going, the only thing that helped her not self-harm. So that really stayed with me, that interview. And just moving on. Yeah, I think just, again, um, some of the thing about access to other mental health services that came up um, in the discussion, obviously in terms of people's experiences generally about comparing this or using this, um, and just key to that was not feeling listened to, um, often feeling like they weren't considered well enough or they felt dismissed in other areas. Um, and um, again, what they refer to as that black hole um, between uh, children's and adult services. Um, and a theme really about not trusting that clinical environment, um, particularly when it was overly formal. Um, and they liked the sort of the more of that sort of building of the relationship and the informality of the, of the budget or the social prescribing type of support. And where they talked about whether that's specifically understood them and their ADHD because of that sort of relationship that's built um, and how it shapes their needs. Uh, so just moving on. Um, again, just highlighting uh, where the issue of stigma came up. Um, and they just um, compared it with experiences elsewhere, um, particularly in terms of where they were felt not recognised or weren't listening uh, or weren't listened to in other services. Um, and some who have felt that they've been able to um, access other services within the organisation. So, for example, in Thurrock Mind, um, as a result of that. Um, and then just moving on to the next slide. Um, I just particularly wanted to kind of highlight, I guess, that, that sort of last quote there um, about that intergenerational nature of it as well. Um, so sort of benefits across the whole family. Uh, next slide. And again, in the bottom right hand corner, the improved access to college education um, that they thought they otherwise wouldn't have had. So I think that's quite critical as well, just to, certainly in terms of wider impacts on, on inequality. And there again, it kind of cuts across a whole range of things from grants, food parcels, youth groups, um, parent support groups and more. And yeah, I think just, I think this is the sort of pretty much the final slide. Um, again, just a summary of some of the um, survey that we did, some of the results that we did within the group. So some of these figures may change because obviously we've got a couple more um, interviews to do and another group to do. Um, but again, it felt like very high figures around um, increasing confidence and about their wider health. Um, and significantly as well about loneliness 
uh, and particularly again over the last year where that's been vital. And yes, um, as I said, the final report's due in 2021, um, in June. And I just wanted to say that um, I feel like I've been talking at everybody for so long and it would be really good to just kind of have a sense of your thoughts. We've got some polling um, questions so I am going to open it up for, for people's um, wider questions to us, but I wonder whether it would be possible for us to just do one quick poll from our polling questions. Sure. Yeah. How, do we, uh, how do we do that? Yes. Yeah, so do, do you want me to put it in the chat, um, Daphne, or are you able to do that? Um, if you can, that'd be great. In the meantime, yeah. I can share my screen because we are a bit in the schedule. Um, so all you need to do is you can either click on the link from an internet browser or you can go on your smartphone as well. And once I open the question, you'll be able to uh, answer the question and we're going to see them on the slide. So do people need to put that um, link into their browser or can we, what's the best way to do this? Um, it, either way would be uh, sufficient. Okay. You can put it on your browser as well. So Daphne, I think it's just question one that's on that poll that we would be yes, likely exactly. to answer. So, it should be active. Let's present it. So the question is, um, you should be able to see it on your phone or your um, window as well, but it's on, I'm sharing it at the same time. So it should be on and you're free to enter anything. It is completely anonymous, but yeah. So it might take a while to get in, I realize. So we are very keen to just see if there's kind of anything that leapt out to people about what could be interest of interest to them in their areas. So whether it's the personal health budgets, where people would have a budget of um, on average up to 500 pounds or the kind of enhanced ones, um, just the aspect of choice and control that it's in, that's in it, the social prescribing element where people are linked to local services, all the kind of different conversations, which is a different way of talking to people. That's really interesting to see. Great. So I guess as um, if people continue to give their comments into um, that poll. That'd be really helpful because I'm sure that you, you'll you just be capturing that in the background, Daphne, is that right? Yes, that's correct, yeah. Brilliant. Okay, so please do please do engage with that. Um, huge thanks to Deborah for taking the time. And in many ways, that's a way we can all give our thanks to Deborah for that hard work she put in, um, both to the project, which is really fantastic and inspiring and really supports um, a lot of the work that is taking place across the country in relation to that personalization agenda, and, you know, great to have the evidence behind why it makes a difference. It's just so powerful. And we look forward to, to the report, uh, Deborah and Daphne from the NCV in June. And perhaps we invite you back to share once that um, is finalised. So thanks again. And if anybody has any specific questions or comments in relation to that presentation, please do put them in the chat. And we will try and find time either towards the end of our webinar today or um, for follow up afterwards. But um, I do want to just move on now and introduce our colleague Al Mully from Dartmouth, who will be, um, well, I'll hand over to you, Al, to introduce yourself and your presentation. Thanks very much. Well, thank you very much. It's a, can you all hear me okay? Yeah. yeah. Um, thank you very much. It's, a, it's a, a pleasure and a privilege to be here. I've learned a great deal from uh, Tom and, and Deborah. Um, I, I'm going to be um, talking about um, work that I've been doing in, in the UK, most recently in the Midlands of England. But first, let me introduce myself a little bit. Uh, I'm currently at Dartmouth. Uh, actually, I'm currently um, visiting with uh, um, friends who've been ill through the, the um, pandemic. 
Um, um, so even even further away in terms of time zones than I would be if I were in Boston or Dartmouth. Um, um, but I've been at Dartmouth as a professor of medicine for um, uh, the last decade. Prior to that, um, I was at Harvard and MGH. And um, um, I spent most of my uh, clinical uh, research career thinking about how doctors and patients make decisions together. Um, I was the first person to make the distinction between warranted and unwarranted variation in healthcare back in 1981, um, which, which led to what we now call um, shared decision making um, with an effort to develop a whole series of shared decision making support programs uh, through the late 1980s and early 1990s. Um, and, um, and I tell you that um, not in a, in a prideful or boastful way, um, because if you think about it, I've been talking about shared decision making now for uh, four decades, um, and it still doesn't happen. <laughs> it, 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 is, it is still not the norm um, anywhere. Um, so to some extent, what I want to do is, is, is talk to you about what um, I've learned working with many colleagues um, from decades of failure in getting um, things that seem to make so sense, so much sense, and, and that are so valued, uh, the kind of relationship building that we've just heard about, um, how to get that into um, practice in a more uniform um, and impactful way at scale. Um, the other thing I want to say early on is that um, I am really committed to efforts to deal practically um, to make people dealing with um, vulnerability due to deprivation and um, mental health issues. Um, because of my personal experience, I, I, um, I, 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 I again, this is, there's, there's, there's nothing prideful here. This is about gratitude. I, I grew up in the most deprived community in my state of Massachusetts. Um, um, my parents were both had their educations interrupted in the eighth grade um, by the depression. Um, and as a result, um, we grew up without many resources and almost no access to health care. Um, there was also a family history of, of serious mental illness, bipolar disease that wasn't recognized as bipolar disease at that early time because it was before it had been recognized and described in detail. So the, the, the effort that um, I and, and, and my partner and, and others from Dartmouth and still from Harvard uh, are, are trying to make in the UK um, is it, for me very important in a purposeful way. Um, okay, that, that said, um, if I can share my screen, can I do that, Neelan? Okay. Yeah. Um, so I, I've already told you, so I'm a professor at Dartmouth and a visiting professor at UCL. And I've been a visiting professor at UCL thanks to um, um, uh, Peter Farnegy and, and the work that we had the opportunity to do. I, I first met um, Peter um, when he had just taken on the, the task of leading uh, mental health at, at UCL um, back about 2011, 2012, when he came to um, Harvard and I was um, still there. And um, um, we had a, an opportunity to um, deepen that relationship um, when he read this paper. I, I was asked in 2010, before I moved from Harvard to Dartmouth, and, um, to um, be the first international visiting fellow at the King's Fund. And um, I was commissioned to make an effort to join up um, practice variation what you often then call the postcode um, um, lottery when, when um, even before the NHS Atlas was produced, um, during a practice variation um, in, with different rates of interventions of different kinds in different geographies um, with shared decision-making and commissioning. And that was a great experience for me because I, I had the opportunity to think about how shared decision-making as how it's usually been defined that is helping a woman make a choice about breast cancer treatment or um, uh, helping a, a man make a choice about treatment of benign prostate disease that is consistent with what matters most to him was um, a, a big part. Well, th this commission was a big part of making me recognize how limited the understanding of shared decision-making was because it was narrowed by that kind of thinking about one big decision to be made, as opposed to the decisions that people make every day 
um, about their long-term conditions or about um, their health and well-being and what they need to do for themselves um, in, in order to make choices that matter for their health and well-being. Um, and Peter um, read this report when it was published in May of 2012 and, and suggested we have a conversation after that. And um, that, that led to my becoming familiar with the Thrive model. Um, and um, Peter was unable to attend virtually at the uh, um, in person at the last minute, um, but um, uh, Dartmouth in making its commitment um, to, to me allowed for a lot of resources to try and test um, how universal some of these ideas were about patient engagement and learning from them their wants and needs in order to better know um, what kind of capacity was missing in the system um, in order to meet their needs and, and their wants and needs. And what we did is we gathered people together in a whole series of seminars that had about 60 to 80 people each, um, usually from as many as 20 countries. And in 2014, we had a, a session uh, that Dartmouth sponsored along with others called New Paradigms for Mental and Behavioral, uh, for Behavioral and Mental Health Care. Um, it was chaired by a Dartmouth colleague by the name of, of, of uh, Bob Drake, who had um, uh, developed um, the program of, of personalizing job work, uh, job pursuits for people with serious mental illness and in individual placement support. Um, and he had also written a great deal about the role of shared decision making in mental health. Um, and, and the team from the UK um, in, included Peter, who did attend virtually, along with Anna Moore, also from um, UCL Partners at the time, Paul Burstow, who was uh, Minister of State for Care um, in the Lib um, Dem uh, Party uh, in the coalition government at the time. And we spent a good deal of time talking about children and adolescents because of the emergence of, of Thrive uh, within this whole group of people gathered in Salzburg. And one of the things that caught people's interest was a, a very practical measurement tool that we were developing at Dartmouth called Collaborate. You may have heard of it. It's three simple questions. How much effort, um, how much effort has been made on a scale of zero to nine uh, to help you understand your health issues? How much effort was made to listen carefully to learn what matters most to you? How much effort was made to consider what matters most to you in planning the next step in your care? And, and that seemed to be very relevant to, um, to the, the, the Thrive model. And, and I think you can see how relevant it is to the eight key principles that Rachel discussed at the outset. And one of the people who attended, again, she had to attend virtually because she had some surgery, unexpected surgery just before the event, is a colleague by the name of Pat Deegan. Some of you may, have, may know of Pat. Uh, Pat was diagnosed with schizophrenia, having presented with auditory hallucinations when she was 17. Um, she saw a very good psychiatrist at Harvard, as a matter of fact, um, who treated her very respectfully, took good care of her. Her auditory hallucinations were gone within four to six months. And he continued to follow her at regular intervals, and she listened carefully every time. And four years after being diagnosed, she came in for one of those routine visits and, and said, uh, Doctor, I've been listening really carefully um, um, to our conversations whenever I see you this way. And I've concluded that you think that your job is to keep me from hearing voices. Um, and you have, and I'm grateful, and my family and friends who were as frightened as I was uh, by those voices uh, at the time um, are also grateful. But look at me, I've gained 50 pounds. I have, um, I have uh, no ambition. I sit in front of the television and chain smoke. Um, and I think that has something to do with the medications I'm taking. So I've determined um, that your job is to keep me functional enough to have a job of my own and let me worry about the voices. Uh, she went on to get a PhD and, and um, has, has um, built a, a very large uh, digital network of peer support within the United States for people with uh, schizophrenia called Common Ground. And you can see the, um, the link to that uh, program for those of you who aren't familiar with it on the slide. 
When I started um, um, working at um, the NHS in, in, with the NHS in England in the early 1980s, my initial collaboration included Clem McPherson, who was at Oxford. So we were, have been working with NHS in particular, way, in particular for many years. Um, I was largely focused on shared decision-making, but saw the need to embed it in practices. Um, yes, the tools were important. Shared decision-making aids were important. Um, but the relationship and, and the time to build relationship and make people um, appreciate their own autonomy um, and their competence in making decisions in a state of relatedness to people they trust was critical. So when I moved to Dartmouth, one condition I set was that we start from scratch in building a new model of primary care, not mental health care, but integrated primary care that was meant to achieve the aims of the five-year full review, primary acute integration, um, integrating mental and physical health and integrating health and social care, um, all for the sake of strategic population health management. And instead of building a practice that would have had four GPs and two nurses and four receptionists for the population of about 5,000 um, Dartmouth employees that we were going to care for, um, we had um, two GPs, one nurse, no receptionists, and we went out and hired 10 people recruited for their relational skills, for their innate ability uh, to relate to people, to listen carefully, to listen affirmatively. And then we trained them in, in um, what we thought they needed to know, not only to do some of the technical work like take blood pressures, um, but, but to, to um, play a critical role in um, building trust with the patient. Um, so we had five of those for every GP, which meant instead of having a 10 minute consultation, the patient would always have a 30 minute consultation and maybe um, three to five minutes would be with the coach and the GP. They'd always see the GP, but they would spend 15 minutes with the coach and at, uh, at the outset and then another 10 minutes to make sure that the patient was leaving with a clear understanding of, of, um, of how they could make choices that mattered for their health and well-being. And this was an incredibly successful in lots of ways. I'm happy to talk to you more about that later. Um, but what I want to do now is to give you a sense of how important it is to think about the hierarchies that exist. If we're going to have parity of esteem, we have to understand the hierarchies that exist when we try and put teams together. And um, one way of thinking about this is this two-dimensional space. And I'm going to do this pretty quickly, but again, we can talk about it. Um, if you look at the vertical axis, you can see difficulty of a task, and it ranges from low to high. And, um, and then on the horizontal axis, um, you have the level of competence necessary to perform that task. Well, in that two-dimensional space, the 45 degree line becomes very interesting um, because everything below it is likely to be inefficient and everything above it is likely to be ineffective or perhaps even unsafe. And I'd, I'd, I'd invite you to go through this exercise sometime. Ask people who care for patients with you, whether they're in primary care or acute care, um, ask them uh, who they would put up here. Um, think about all of their patients' needs. And if adults are included, you'll often hear them talking about cardiac surgeons up here. Um, uh, you'll often hear them talking about neurosurgeons up here. Um, and they're usually pretty close to the uh, top of their license because they can organize their time to not have much of it um, be wasted. And you then um, think about GPs. And GPs are often a little bit further to the origin, and they're often working down here well below their license because of all of the, all of the um, uh, managerial work they have to do in, in seeing patients and the box ticking they have to do to uh, stay clear of CCG's IRs. Um, so the, 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 the interesting thing about this is um, when you ask people to populate this two-dimensional space, um, you can then say, okay, let's, let's, let's qualify the difficulty and competence that we're talking about. Let's say it's technical difficulty. Now populate the space and nothing much changes. <laughs> but then you say, well, um, what if it's relational difficulty that we're talking about in the task and relational competence? Now populate the space. All of a sudden, the people who are down here, like the, the, uh, um, the, the, the 
social worker for children and adolescents or the mental health worker, all of a sudden they're here except they're usually down here again because of the inefficiency of, of the way their time has to be used because of the way the system's designed. Okay, I hope that, and the other thing is um, that single straight line looks like a tightrope and is therefore very, very scary. So you, the other way I use this slide is to emphasize the critical importance of teamwork and teamwork that is relationally coordinated with shared goals, shared knowledge, mutual respect and communications that's frequent, timely, problem solving and accurate. Now, if, if we move this, this model of, of dealing with the shortage of, of, of workforce um, and the, the, the kind of siloed nature of workforce, um, uh, Deb, Deb mentioned the, 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 the way in which the holistic approach was, was valued um, by um, service users. Um, you know, if you think about putting together teams where people come from different siloed training programs, it's a little bit like um, putting a brick wall together, um, but often there's no mortar holding those bricks together. What, what, what if people were, were trained specifically for this um, holistic role? Um, what if instead of the other books I had up there, my primary care text and shared decision making and um, innovation, um, what, if, what if it was more about the kind of talk therapy that applies not only to healthcare, but to psychological problems and to social care practice? And, and that in, in, in many ways has underlying it a, a theory of, of, of self-determination um, that emphasizes the importance of autonomy and competence and relatedness leading to trust. Um, One of the things that we've been um, doing in Black Country, West Birmingham, where there is a, a, a good deal of, of deprivation, is thinking about this model of, of holistic health and well being guides or coaches, and the, the, the name doesn't matter, um, who, um, who are recruited into a curriculum um, that was built specifically for this purpose uh, to deal with the mental health issues. Of, of everybody they encounter, whether it's in the primary care setting, whether it's in a specific mental um, health setting, whether it's in the acute trust setting where so many mental health problems find themselves in A&E, for instance. Um, but but they, they are recruited for their relational skills and then trained in shared decision-making, motivational interviewing and cognitive behavioral therapy and, and other approaches that we know work but just don't have the time to do because of the way care is designed. Um, we're at the very early stages of talking with progressive leaders of further education colleges to talk about um, how that recruitment process would go from areas with, with um, great deprivation, um, what the curriculum would look like, what an apprenticeship would look like, um, and what a certification program would look like um, so that these people could be hired with um, the risk associated with those hired and being mitigated as much as possible. And I'll, I'll close with this. This is a, a result of the work we did. We, we worked with six um, uh, primary care networks, um, each of whom was asked to identify a vulnerable population that they cared a great deal about. So that their work with us would be both, both purposeful, they wanted to make life better for these people, um, and also practical. We gave them tools like collaborate and integrate and other measures that could let them know whether they were heading in the right direction with the changes they were making. At the end of this six month program, five of these six teams had very credible um, uh, business cases for models of care that would use these kinds of workers to improve the health and well being. But the critical point I want to make that goes back to the title that might have surprised you is that um, if there's easily avoidable ignorance at the front lines between um, a clinician and a clinical team and uh, a, a, a patient and their family about what's realistically possible on the part of the patient and family and on the part of the clinical team, what really matters. If there's easily avoidable ignorance at those front lines, and, and I think you would all agree with me, we can demonstrate there is, and, and, and it's, it, it's not the exception. May not be the rule, but it's not the exception. No decisions throughout the system 
about capacity building, about workforce planning, um, about any of the investments made at the system level can be informed. There has to be this, this learning front end designed specifically to learn from patients what they want and need if we're ever going to meet those needs and wants at the population level. I'll stop there. And, and this, this little highlight here just underlines the importance of those individual choices informing um, all of the choices at the neighborhood and place and system level. Thank you, Al. Re really powerful and, um, and really helpful also to, to give the context to your background and the wealth of research that's also gone into this area that actually Deborah's presentation brought to life in a very practical way. Yeah. Yep. Um, and okay. those very clear theoretical underpinnings. So really, really valuable. And also I think a, a strong message for us all working across the children's landscape, across health, education, social care, um, local authorities and voluntary sector providers, um, particularly with the focus now on moving to the, towards integrated care systems and the, you know, some of the learning from that work that you've been you've been very much in, involved in and, and leading. So thank you very much. I'm sure that it's provoked lots of thoughts for our um, audience today. And so please do put any comments in the chat or we can follow up afterwards. I'm mindful of time moving on um, and want to take time to introduce Georgia to give her presentation. But thank you again, Al. And um, we'll be sharing those slides as well and we'll be able to pick up on any additional comments. So. Um, a huge thanks to you, and particularly for joining across the time zones. I know that's an addition. <laughs> so thanks ever so much for that. Um, okay, so on to Georgie now, um, who I will introduce. Uh, so Georgina Fozard is currently a Darcy Fellow, and she's going to share some reflections now on a journey from theory to action in bringing co-production into reality. So over to you, Georgie. Thanks, Rachel. Okay, I um, hope you can see my slides there. Okay, so um, yeah, so I'm a I'm a Darcy Fellow, um, and I'm a Child and Adolescent Psychiatry Registrar um, in North London. And uh, I wanted to talk a little bit about co-production, which people have mentioned a lot today, um, and just you know the the journey of actually sort of trying it out and what that's like and um i know lots of people are trying to do co-production pro projects but it's quite challenging work and just to have a little think about where you go from the theory um so just a little bit of theory here so so steven zetal um defines co-production as being about broadening and deepening public services so that they're no longer the preserve of professionals and commissioners, but a shared responsibility uh, with communities. So building and using a multifaceted network of mutual support, which, which absolutely fits, fits with iThrive. Um, and, and Boyle and Harris make a link with how badly uh, equipped um, public services are to respond to demand because they've largely overlooked the underlying operating system they depend on. So the social economy of family and neighborhood. So um, as part of, of my, my Darcy work, um, I did a, a, an assignment and a, a literature review all about co-production. And what came through from, from that reading was that the, the reason co-production is needed is because of some underlying um, uh, problems in our, in our society, a lot of them to do with the market economy and the, phen the social phenomena that arise from that. So um, I broke it down into um, it's addressing notions of value in society. So what do we value? Do we do we just value um, money and, and paid work or do we value family and, and support networks? Um, it, it also aims to address sustainability of services. So um, thinking about how um, people can contribute to services and how they run, um, but also the unsustainability of a model which um, uh, creates dependency and um, sort of disempowers um, people who are accessing services. Um, and then in thinking about how you make co-production happen, there's definitely something about 
needing to challenge quite professionalized and paternalistic organizational cu cultures. And part of that is about getting um, patients, service users, families in and promoting a much more reciprocal um, relationship with them where, where they're, they're a bit more equal and, um, and that also involves staff going on a bit of a journey about how they see themselves. And then the fourth um, factor was, was about addressing um, the individualism and, and loneliness in society and the need to build social networks um, because people will only feel well when they have relationships. Um, so you will have seen these graphics, I'm sure, but um, essentially co-production is about moving from simply doing to patients um, up through the ladder to consultation, but ultimately to hopefully um, patients um, co-producing co um, and delivering um, services. So it might involve peer support or it might involve co-design and so designing any innovations or changes that we that we put through. Um, so one of the things I was thinking about was how to gain momentum amongst staff. Um, so uh, so Zeng um, talks about the degree to which our social roles make moral claims on all of us to um, it exercise our agency through the system and and this is what will bring about the conditions for transformation and change um, and and they note that co-production promotes engagement with and autonomy from the state at the same time and that um, can generate political struggle and change um, and was thinking about the impact of covid and what will what kind of state will this leave healthcare staff in and communities in, and and will this be a kind of moment um, at which people feel able to disrupt and do things differently and look um, beyond the bounds of their institutions as they are right now? So, so this was a development of the Nesta framework for co-production, which you're probably all aware of, but definitely worth looking up if you're not. Um, and um, the, this was um, sort of developed from uh, the Black Lives Matter movement with the idea that in order to change a culture within an, an organisation or a system, um, there needs to be a degree of disruption and a, and a breaking down of current roles um, and professional roles. Because what co-production is asking is that staff shift from the way they've always done things which is sort of delivering a service to a patient with that quite stark power imbalance um, to something that's much more collaborative and uh, and doing that um, with that sort of creative work will um, will mean that staff need to let go of their roles as they saw them and and how do we create that space um, and it, it's it, and part of this is I think that people don't necessarily, people use the term co-production, but don't necessarily have the time to really understand what, what it means or why, why it's valuable. And, and why it's valuable, I would argue, what are these two other parts of this triangle? So um, connecting people, which as others have said, you know, those relationships are what will help people stay well but also empowering people especially people with men, uh, young people with mental health problems and giving them the sense that they are competent and they can do something in the world so what um what we did um in uh, north central london was to um develop a, a group um of young people and parents across uh, Barnet, Enfield and Harrogate, um, Camden and Islington and invite them to be, to, to be a group together to feed into the, particularly the CAMS crisis pathways. Um, this is a driver diagram that we made at the start, um, which I won't dwell on, but essentially it was quite a helpful way of, of thinking about what ideas do we need to kind of come up with and start acting on to start to make this happen because there wasn't 
much of a blueprint across the um, integrated care system, although there were small pockets. There were people doing um, involvement work with patients in each trust, but um, as a larger system across North Central London, there was a group for adults, but there was nothing for young people. These are just some of the kind of, um, in, we meet once a month and, uh, and have had lots of fun um, kind of brainstorming and getting feedback from the experience of young people kind of going into A&E when they're in crisis. Um, and they've been amazing at feeding some of that back um, to the um, hospitals and the paediatric network in North London. So just to think about um, what, you know, having tried to do this kind of work, what have been the challenges in the system? So what, what we found was that there's initially a, a, a kind of scepticism about collaboration from parts of the network because people are quite used to working in their little areas. And um, so that, that takes a lot of work to kind of break that down. Uh, accessing patients to be involved is takes lots of constant kind of asking and hassling and finding allies, finding people that are interested. Um, and that's an ongoing job kind of um, recruiting uh, people. Um, and then um, part of, you know, what a fundamental um, part of doing this kind of work is, is valuing people um, as equal um, participants. And that means offering payments. So we had to try and get some funding for um, people attending the meetings and, and that was a, a barrier initially. Um, and then, uh, you know, there were anxieties about safety and information governance and, you know, who's going to look after the patients when they come or, and, and the approach we took was to just try it and just do it. And, um, one of the, the phrases that people always say um, on the Darcy course is don't ask for permission, ask for forgiveness. So that was the stance we took. And then, you know, as, as things have gone on, we've managed to um, put in place structures to keep people safe and um, make sure that there's governance. So learning how to run the group. Um, so things that we noticed were that bringing um, patients or parents along to uh, kind of formal work meetings um, can be quite challenging for professionals, can change the dynamics and, um, you know, the, the parents or the young people can throw in curveballs and it's, it's quite hard to kind of manage that um, uh, when, when you're bringing people along and, and kind of manage um, the, you know, expectations on both sides. Um, and then the importance of, of looking after people who are contributing. So we put a lot of time into briefing um, the young people before and then debriefing with them afterwards, because it can be quite emotional um, telling their story. Um, and, uh, you know, they overall, they felt really, em I think, empowered and have really enjoyed it, but it can, it can stir things up sometimes. And we've been, our group has got parents and patients and young people together, um, but sometimes that's a bit uncomfortable for either side. So we're, next month, what we're going to try to do is we're going to have some time where parents are on their own and young people on their own and then bring them together as well. Um, and then the other thing is about equalities. Um, so, you know, we, we tend to have mainly uh, women um, and and girls in this um, and from certain communities so it's, it's going to be an ongoing challenge to get um, some other um, people involved from different communities and backgrounds so Rachel I will wrap up imminently but just just in terms of lessons learned um, so it's been really rewarding work um, the patient stories have really cut through the politics um, at some events I think um, and it's resource heavy work it takes a lot of time doing this so we need from the sit wider system we need a concerted sort of systemic investment from trusts to, to work in this way um, and uh, I think that ultimately this, you know, ideas such as peer support and psychoeducational groups and shifting support into the community um, 
can be done, but uh, we're going to have to be brave and it might be quite challenging for staff. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Georgie. Really helpful um, bringing co-production to life and uh, and how it genuinely challenges the system in, in positive, but also unexpected ways and how we, we need to be prepared for that, but also embrace it because of um, the ways in you know, which we might not be able to see alternatives. So thanks ever so much. Now, I'm very aware of time and that we've overrun, which uh, is a sign that we were a little bit ambitious with our agenda for today. Um, but if anybody does have any specific questions, please do put them in the chat. We can pose them to our presenters and um, you know, ensure that you get any follow up in relation to that. We do have just a couple of slides just to end because um, it, it would be really helpful if people have a chance to give us some feedback on today. There's, we'll put a Mentimeter link in the chat so to get any feedback on your experience of today's webinar. And if there are particular areas that you found uh, helpful and also areas that you would like us to focus on in future community of practice events. And, um, and just to say that we are in the autumn with the restrictions lifting and the excitement of the community about um, you know, moving to safer working um, arrangements, we are planning on moving to face-to-face -to -face, um, webinar, sorry, face-to-face -face delivery of our community of practice again, events again in the autumn so that it gives greater opportunity for collaboration and sharing learning and relationship building across, uh, you know, we, we know it's a challenge delivering the webinars. We do have a couple more scheduled for June and July and the um, overview is, is just there on the slide now. So in June, we have um, uh, a webinar focusing specifically on approaches to enhance children, young people and their families understanding of the Thrive Framework for System Change, which um, is, uh, you know, drawing on learning from across the country. And also in July, we have a specific focus on applying quality improvement methodology to support Thrive Framework for implementation. So please do um, look at those and consider booking onto those webinars. And then uh, the final slide does give you the, um, the code for Menti for any feedback that we, um, we would really, really value that. I'm, I'm mindful of time, so we won't open that um, just now, um, but please do give us any feedback by logging into www.menti.com and use the code that is there on the screen and also in the chat that will take you directly to the, to the questions. Um, and thanks very much, yes, please do add your comments to the chat um, and we'll make sure that we, we respond and share that information. And we will also do a summary that we can circulate in the Community of Practice newsletter. So just a reminder of the website for further information about both the iThrive programme team and also the Thrive Framework for System Change. It's www.implementingthrive.org. And if you aren't a member of the community of practice, do sign up. Um, because of GDPR regulations, we do need to have a specific request to sign you up to our newsletter where you get that information. So please sign up at ithriveinfo at tavi-port.nhs.uk. And slightly overrun, apologies for that, but thanks all at five past and a very big thank you to all our speakers. So to um, Tom from NHS ENI, to Deborah and um, uh, Daphna from National Children's Bureau, from Al Murray from the Dartmouth Institute and Georgie, uh, current Darcy Fellow. Thank you all very much for your contributions. Really, really helpful, insightful, and gives us all lots to reflect on and learn from in our work. So thanks once again to you all and we will the sharing the slides and the recording of the webinar. So thanks all and we'll draw it to a close. Thank you. Bye all.